here's an advert from an old magazine, The Gambler, sitting there with a, some cards. He's a bit happy-go-lucky. Things will be better next year. They're sure to give me a raise. Wait till I get my chance. That's what he needs to succeed. The opportunity. He's just waiting there. Not actively developing himself. This picture, here's the full context of it, is taken from an advert given by the Pelman Institute in magazines that were published around 1929. And I'm showing you this because it's one of the earliest, in fact, it's the earliest occurrence of this myth that people have been able to find in the published literature. Down here in this red box, I've enlarged it, and we'll see it's a bit like that quote from Psychology Today. There's only one sure way, yes, only one, to get what you want out of life. Make your own brain just a little bit more efficient. Okay. And you will multiply your own power. There is no limit to what the human brain can accomplish. Scientists and psychologists tell us we use only about 10% of our brain power. The mind is like a muscle. It grows in power through exercise and use. It weakens and deteriorates with idleness. Scientists and psychologists. I like to think we are scientists. Uh, this was 1929. This is the earliest published example of a 10% figure. Now the Pelman Institute, like Joel Saltzman, author of Shake That Brain, are trying to sell you something. Down here at the bottom right is a coupon you can click. Send away you send me without obligation your free booklet, Scientific Mind Training. This is not placing under any obligation and no salesman will call on me. It's a bit like those games you can download to your phone, the brain training things. They're going to sell you a booklet that can increase your brain power, make you use that other 90%. So, that seems to be the real origin way back in the 1920s. So, companies who are making clever claims using the argument to slip an argument into your subconsciousness, they make the claim. Self-help charlatans trying to sell you something make the claim. Now, the first group are just lazy. They're just taking that belief because they know you accept it and they're using it as an argumentative tool. Rhetoric. But the second are doing it out of self-interest. And one of the great big daddies of self-help books is a man called Dale Carnegie. He wrote books called How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. Here he is. He looks friendly enough. He also wrote this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Anyone heard of this book? Yeah? It's something we all want to do. We all want to win friends and influence people. And he sold over 15 million copies, it says on the cover of that book. Here's how to stop worrying and start living. Not quite a good cover. And here's a quote from it. Page 123. He says that the renowned William James was speaking of men who had never found themselves when he declared that the average man develops only 10% of his latent mental abilities. So here we have a quote with a source. Compared to what we ought to be, he wrote, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts, which he habitually fails to use. That's in quotes. If it's in quotes, that means William James must have said this. But you notice, it doesn't actually say anything about 10% in that quote. 
It's not saying we're only using 10% of our brain. But at least we've got a source now, <coughs> the renowned William James. So we can go back and say, where did, where did William James say this quote? Here is William James, and he is one of my heroes. He is the most famous sort of early psychologist, philosopher <coughs> in America. And he wrote some really quite readable books, one called Principles of Psychology in 1890, in which he came up with all of these phrases that we still use today. You might recognise them from websites and prospectuses. We all just slip these into our rhetoric when we're trying to recruit students. We talk about psychology as the science of mental life. Well, he said that first. We talk about the stream of consciousness. He said that before James Joyce. He was the brother of the novelist Henry James. And he was just as good at writing. So did he actually say this? Well, down here in red, I've put a web link to um, a URL. It's also on my reading lists. Because he was writing such a long time ago, everything he wrote is out of print, out of copyright, rather. And so there is a website called Psych Classics at York University in Canada, where they've got lots of old classical texts that are out of copyright. A lot of William James's work is there. So if you follow this link, slash James, slash principles, you can read this textbook from the 1890s. You can also find a paper he published in 1906 called The Energies of Men in that renowned journal, Science. Even then it was on volume 635. And here we find the quote that Dale Carnegie used. The exact same words that he put in quotation marks. So it's true, William James did say the words that Dale Carnegie specifically attributed to him. But you can see there's a lot of black on this slide because he didn't just say the words that were attributed to him. Dale Carnegie <coughs> took them out of their context. He was quoting selectively to support his claim. If I fill in the whole passage, we can see that William James was saying something slightly different to the spin that Del Carnegie was putting on it. He was really talking about motivation. <coughs> Everyone is familiar with the phenomenon of feeling more or less alive on different days. Everyone knows on any given day that there are energies slumbering in him, which the incitements of that day <coughs> do not call forth, but which he might display if these were greater. Most of us feel as if we lived habitually with a sort of cloud wearing on us. Below our highest notch of clearness in discernment, sureness in reasoning, or firmness in deciding. Then the quote. Compared with what we ought to be, we're only half awake. A metaphor coming up, a bit Victorian. Our fires are damped, our drafts are checked. We are making use of only a small part of our possible <coughs> mental and physical resources. Dot, 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 a lot of missing text. The human individual lives usually far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. And then more context. He energises below his maximum and he behaves below his optimum. So he was saying nothing about <coughs> we only use 10% of our brain, or we only use a fraction of our brain, he was simply saying, we don't normally do everything that we're capable of. We're not continually living to our maximum, our optimum. Most days, we just muddle through. We're not motivated to achieve. So he was actually tackling this problem of motivation. Why is it that sometimes we can excel and surprise ourselves when most of the time we don't? He was not saying what Dale Carnegie attributed to him outside the quotes 
that the renowned philosopher said we only use 10% of our brain. So let's rephrase this myth. Not that we only use 10% of our brain, but maybe we're only using 10% of our mental capacity. We're only achieving 10% of what we could achieve. Is this more defensible? Is this something that we could argue?